Welcome. I'm David, an educator here at the National Museum of the United States Navy. I'm joined today by George Galdoris. If I mispronounce your name, I'm sorry, sir. A career naval aviator and award-winning author. He has served our nation for 30 years on active duty around the world in many positions. George is in many forms of literature, which you can see in many categories. He's an award-winning author along the way. His work is available at your favorite places wherever you get your reading material. Um, without taking too much time, I'd like to start with a very simple question today. George, can you give us some way of which this book began? Yeah, no, David, thanks for that question. So, um, you know, walking this back to the, the picture, we're talking about the, the Kissing Sailor book, which uh, on the cover is Alfred Eisenstadt's um, famous photo of the sailor kissing the nurse um, on the VJ Day, August 14th, 1945. And um, first of all, the, the three people in that picture uh, shouldn't have been there. They shouldn't have been alive. Um, George Mendonza, the sailor, was uh, part of um, uh, Admiral Bull Halsey's um, uh, Task Force 32, which encountered a huge uh, typhoon in the Pacific, and um, uh, several ships were sunk, and uh, 700 sailors died. Uh, he was the helmsman on his ship and, and survived that. Uh, Greta Zimmer Friedman, the the um, the woman in the picture, who was not a nurse but a dental assistant, uh, but their uh, their uniforms looked the same. Um, happened to be of the Jewish faith tradition, and uh, she, her family lived in Austria. And by 1939, um, uh, being of the Jewish faith tradition in, in Austria was a, a dangerous thing. So her parents put. Uh, Greta and her sister on a, a boat to, um, to New York City to live with relatives. And then uh, Alfred Eisenstadt, the photographer, was a German soldier in World War I. Uh, his unit was wiped out in the uh, Battle of Verdun, uh, but he had been injured uh, several days before and was in the hospital. So, you know, remarkable uh, life stories for these people and uh, remarkable they all were alive to meet up in, uh, in Times Square that day. I mean, that alone is just so fascinating. I mean, when you look at war in any form, especially this war, it was so miraculous that anyone was surviving, especially somebody Jewish from that area. Um, now, would you say the outline of the book came just from historic research and facts, or where all did you get the information to write about this book? Yeah, well, um, that's a pretty long journey, so I'll break it up into bite-sized chunks. So, um, first of all, there was a controversy about this picture for decades. Uh, Alfred Eisenstadt, uh, when he went out to take the picture in Times Square, and, and Alfred Eisenstadt was their eighth photographer, so you don't tell him what to do. You say, go to Times Square and, and take pictures. So he did. Um, took this picture, actually took four pictures of this kiss. This is the second picture, the famous one. And uh, he got separated from his reporter. So um, he didn't get the names of the people. He just snapped the, the photo and they went away and he went away and he, he put about 40 photos in the slot for Life magazine that night. And they called him the next morning. They said, Alfred, this, this picture is fantastic. And he said, what picture? Uh, he didn't know. So this picture was published in Life magazine. It became quite famous. And then um, 35 years after the picture was taken in 1980, Life Magazine said, you know, um, we want to do a retrospective on, on World War II. This is our most famous photo. Actually, it's one of the two most famous photos of World War II, the other one being the raising the flag at Iwo Jima, of course. And they said, um, we'd like to talk to the sailor and the nurse. Would the sailor and the nurse please raise your hand. And David, guess what happened? Uh, lots of people raised their hands. And these people were in charlatans, you know, 35 years later. First of all, there was a lot of liquor being poured in and around Times Square that day for, for obvious reasons. And so people looked at that picture and they go, yeah, I, I was a sailor and I had black hair and I was pretty tall. And the, the woman said the same thing. And so for decades, there were all these pretenders uh, who were saying, coming forth and saying they were the person. So that's one bite-sized chunk. The other uh, bite-sized chunk is um, my co-author, Lara Veria, 
is a um, is a, a, a high school teacher in um, Bristol, Rhode Island, and he uses pictures like this to teach history. And he was showing this picture to a class um, one day, and a kid in the back of the room, Anthony Rizzolo, said, uh, "Ah, Mr. Varia, I, I know who that." sailor is it's george mendonza he lives in newport i have breakfast with him on saturdays well the problem was uh, uh, anthony was the class clown so everyone yeah fine and, you know larry didn't think any more of it until he was in newport um that summer and he walked by a, a restaurant called the handy lunch and in the restaurant window was a picture taken by eisenstadt along with a picture of a sailor in his blues so he went in and he asked the hostess, you know, what's this about? I said, oh, that's George. He's a, he's a fisherman. You can go down to the docks and, and, and talk with him. So Larry talked with him briefly, agreed to go interview him because he was fascinated by it, uh, interviewed him and was absolutely convinced that he was the Kissick sailor. And as a history teacher, he, you know, as, as in your line of work, uh, David, he wanted to do something about it and he promised himself we would write something etc cetera, etc cetera. well he didn't do any of that and um years later um uh he was showing the picture and um uh, one of his students said oh yeah that's uh, george mendonza he died and larry was like oh my god i i said i would do something i didn't do something i feel so badly um and later the same person came back and said no he's he's not dead he's alive so you know it's kind of like the blues brothers were on a mission from god larry said i'm gonna prove this guy is the kissing sailor and he embarked on this um multi-phase uh, effort to do that um and it was, it was very technical it was forensic anthropologist it was um it was a mitsubishi um an early mri kind of thing etc cetera, etc cetera. And it was absolutely convinced that this guy was the sailor. So that's another bite-sized chunk. So the third part of that is um, I uh, was visiting a, a former Navy friend, um, still a friend in, in Newport, and, um, you know, had dinner. And, and David, I'm from New York City, so, you know, my parents taught me, you know, when you ride the subway, number one, you don't talk to anyone. You don't even make eye contact. So. So my friend Jerry said, uh, hey, I want you to meet my next door neighbor. And I'm kind of hemming and hawing. He says, no, nah, you'll enjoy this. So we walk next door and here's George Mendonza. And you walk into his basement. It's like a, a naval museum. And uh, we talk and, um, you know, he tells me about his experience. He signs a photo of this picture and gives it to me. I go home, I show it to my wife. I go to work, I show it to my coworkers and put it on the shelf and didn't think anything else about it. So. I'm wrapping this up, I promise. So um, so the fourth bite-sized chunk here is that um, about a year later, um, Jerry O'Donnell called me and said, hey, I've got a friend, Larry, and he's written 80,000 words about this guy and proving he's the Kissing Sailor. And, um, you know, he, he can't get a, an agent because he doesn't have anything published, he can't get a publisher because he doesn't have an agent, et cetera. Would you at least talk with him and see if you can collaborate? So I talked, we agreed to collaborate, and we uh, we took his material and, and tuned it up a little bit and um, went to the Naval Institute and they uh, they published the book. That, I mean, just just the steps to go through that is fascinating. I mean, I, I, I love doing a lot of research. I, I love doing the deep dives. That sounds phenomenal. So you actually answered my next question is where'd you get the idea from this? And just listening to that tells me, but could you give me a little bit about how does this book help people understand maybe the emotions, the time, what was happening in the nation at that time of the world? Yeah, um, uh, let me answer it this way, if it's okay. So when, when Larry, uh, you know, crafted his 80,000 words originally, his, um, uh his um initial title for the book is my search for the kissing sailor and uh i bounced that off of one of my editors uh who had published my first two novels and was now working in a nonfiction house and uh, said um uh, hey Stephen, you know what do you think about this idea and he said i think it's a great idea but you need to come up with a different title so 
you know, we used the title, the Kitzing Sailor, but the underlying thing was um, the five Ps, and this is the answer to your question. So first of all, um, it's it's the picture. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, along with the raising the flag at Iwo Jima, it's the, the most famous photo that's come out of World War II. And then it's, um, it's the place, you know, Times Square, crossroads of the world, and, you know, it's, it still is. People who stay up late enough to watch the ball drop on New Year's Eve, that's, that's the place. And then it's the publication. Um, you know, Life Magazine was, was, for those of us of a certain age, it was, it was part of your life. And that's how you learned about the world before there was the internet and everything else. And then the people, and again, I, I mentioned their life story uh, of, of the three principles. And then the last part of it was the proof, um, proving, um, you know, that these two people were the, the principles in the picture. And, and, um, and um, not in a mean way, but showing that the, the primary pretenders uh, for the people in the picture were, were not, could not, have been the pretenders based on their facial makeup, based on their height, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that was the, you know, how we, how we put it all together. And then, um, you know, why the, the Naval Institute decided to, um, uh, to publish the book. That, that's great. So now you've worked with the Institute Press before, correct? I have, I've, I've written articles for them for, um, for decades and, um, they published the Kissing Sailor book. They've also published a book with my co-author, Sam Tangretti, on artificial intelligence. And um, so, yeah, I've had a long and, and fruitful relationship with them. Now, we're presenting this talk on Valentine's Day. Do you think that that is an appropriate day for this particular book? And do you think that there's any reason that it's best for that? No, I think it's great for Valentine's Day. So, um, so a couple of things, um, and and the reason. So you haven't asked, but but I'll jump in there with it. You know, why did this sailor go kiss this nurse? So uh, during his uh, time in in the Pacific Theater, um, his this, George Mendonza's destroyer was escorting a um, a, a larger ship and. A, uh, it took fire from a Japanese aircraft. It, it, the ship was caught on fire. Many, many sailors were horribly burned. And from his ship, he could watch Navy nurses, you know, triaging these these horribly burned sailors and helping them and holding their hands and just just realize, you know, what Navy nurses did to make, you know, to, to try to help help our sailors. And um, so on this day. Um, he and his girlfriend at the time, who he'd only known for two weeks, Rita, were at Radio City Music Hall watching uh, A Bell for Adana. And um, someone said, the war is over. So uh, they streamed out of Radio City Music Hall. And in 1945, if you want to know the truth and what's happening, where do you go? You go to Times Square and you watch the ticker that's telling the news um, and Greta Zimmer Friedman uh, it was her lunch hour and someone came in the dental office and said the war is over and it was her lunch hour so she went to Times Square to see the news on the ticker and then you know as George uh, Bendanza barreled into Times Square after stopping at, at several bars and having many drinks um, saw um, saw this nurse and went up and kissed her. And, and that's how that all happened. And, and again, Alfred Eyes that uh, took the shot. Um, some years ago, uh, we had a um, an event at the Navy Memorial and brought George and Greta there uh, to talk about this event. And uh, the Naval Institute came and, you know, sold books and everything. but. Um, and it was wonderful. It wasn't people of a certain age. There were college students there wanting to hear these stories. And one young woman uh, asked Greta, she said, well, you know, I'm looking at what happened and what he did. It, it looks like 
sexual assault to me. And Greta, who was a very quiet woman, said, young lady, you just don't understand. You were not there at that time. You hadn't lived through four years of war with you know, hundreds of thousands of our soldiers and sailors and airmen Marines being killed and the thought that we might have to invade Japan and lose hundreds of thousands more. So that it was an emotional time. So no, it wasn't sexual assault. It was people coming together to celebrate the fact that this horrible, horrible war was finally over. You actually answered my other question there is what I love, which is how did this affect time period? Because like today, oh, the idea of just going up and kissing someone is flabbergasted for people. But back then, especially at the end of the war, where all the emotions were so raw, it was allowable and actually something that they were aware of that this is happening. Yeah, and and again, I think you know most people think about okay, the war and, and everything, but th there were there were solid plans to uh, invade Japan, you know, before the the nuclear bombs were dropped and. Um, based on how many um, uh, Marines we had lost in uh, in recent battles like um, uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa and Guadalcanal, you know, th there were reliable estimates that we lose a quarter million Americans invading the, Japan. So the fact that we didn't have to do that was this this complete relief uh, among our you know people that is so true i you know working at the navy museum we've always had to tell people no this is why these things happen and history is a fact we can't change history and the idea and the views of what happened is great do you have anything else you would like to say about your book um well, first of all, it was it was joyful doing it because we got to know uh, George and Greta. And, you know, Larry and I said if we never sold a copy of the book, the fact that we got to meet those people and hear their stories was, you know, w was reward enough. Um, but no, I think it's I think it's a great book for Valentine's Day because it is it is a, a love story. And again, uh, George did not marry. Um, uh Greta he married Rita the woman with him and it's just a little inside baseball on the book if you look at the cover and look at that picture um behind George Mendonza's um uh right shoulder is a picture of a woman her you see her eyes and her nose and her mouth is a little uh, cut off and that's uh, that's his woman who became his wife Rita and they asked Rita about you know how do you feel about this, that your boyfriend went up and, you know, kissed this, this woman? She said, I feel great. I, I, I knew the emotions of the day and, and um, the fact that, you know, he, he felt moved to do that. It was just um, uh, just a wonderful thing. Thank you very much. Um, th this has been a pleasure and it is great to meet you in a digital person. And thank you very much for talking with us today. We're going to put your information at the bottom. So if people would like to get hold of you, um, would that be okay? No, totally okay. I, I um, not to get all misty-eyed about it, but I've had a a lot of mentors who've um, uh, brought me along, you know, in my in my writing career. And so shame on me if I don't pay it forward. So anyone who's thinking about writing or wants to do this kind of work, uh, happy to happy to uh, work with them. Okay. And because you talked about all the people who've helped you in your writing, would you like to talk about the type of locations you had to go for any research besides just trying to track down the people, the history of it that you might have used? Yeah. So, um, to, you know, in, in, in today you can do an awful lot of research on the, on the web, um, for actually the, the, the most traveling I've done for research on any book, my co-author Tom Phillips and I did a book um, about 
12 years ago called uh, Leave No Man Behind. And it was, um, it's the history of combat search and rescue. And, and as your listeners know, um, you know, if one of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, or Marines gets caught behind enemy lines, we need to go get them because they're not going to be put in prison. They're going to be tortured by Al-Qaeda and, uh, you know, executed on, on TV. So it's an important mission. Um, but to do the research for that, um, we went to the uh, Navy History and Historical Society in, in, uh, in, um, in the Washington Navy Yard because that's where all the records are. Every ship, every base, every squadron does a, a history uh, each year. And I'd always wonder when I was a junior officer in the Navy, well, where did these live? Well, they live in the Navy Yard. So you go to the Navy Yard and you talk to the people there and said, I'd like to see the um, uh, the annual history for HS4 for 1968. And someone goes into the archives and brings it out and you, you read about this uh, heroic rescue, um, uh, picking, a, picking up airmen in Haiphong Harbor, those sorts of things. And so, yeah, that was the most, I think, traveling and location thing um, that I've done. And then, you know, for my novels, um, um, the, they're all naval thrillers. And uh, for one, I um, uh, it was took place on an aircraft carrier. I'd served on aircraft carriers, but it had been a while. So there's a, I hope it's not too long an answer. There's an office um, for the Navy Chief of uh, Information in New York City, where they help people who are writing books who want to get things accurately. So, you know, if you were just regular citizen, uh, you can say, I'd like to go on Miramar Air Base and see Marine Ospreys or, or whatever the case may be. And they they bet that and, and usually say yes. So I uh, talked to that office and, and I live in Coronado, California, next to North Island, where we have our carrier's berth. And I asked the lieutenant there, I said, well, I'd like to have access to Carl Vinson. And um, she said, sir, you, you were chief of staff on an aircraft carrier for five years. You know, you know where everything is. I said, I don't know where everything is. There's, I want to have the right compartment number. I want to have the correct passageway. And I need to go there and, and take notes and make sure that's accurate. Because that's the, the fastest way to lose readers is to just have um, gross inaccuracy. So, yeah, so that that's probably the extent of most of my travels to, to do writing. Well, that's excellent, and that's a great plug for uh, part of the command that we're part of, which is Navy History and Heritage Command. And thank you very much again. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? No, sir. I just, uh, as you can tell from the, the tenor of my voice, I, I love talking about books and um, just very fortunate that this book um, uh, made it, uh, got escape velocity. And, uh, and that people have enjoyed it. So, um, so, so that's about it, David. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh